and welcome to Temple Talk from Jerusalem, Israel. Rabbi Chaim Richman here together with Yitzhak Ruhain. Today, the third day of the month of Elul, last month on the Hebrew calendar. Today is August the 14th, 2018, and this Shabbat Parshat Shoftim. The third of Elul, by the way, which is today, is the um, 83rd uh, yard site, the anniversary of the passing of the illustrious Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cohen Cook, chief rabbi of Israel before it was even the state of Israel, and it was still British Mandate, one of the greatest original thinkers and philosophers of Torah in modern times. And welcome to the wonderful world of Elul. Anida Dodi Vidodili. It is time of special closeness with Hashem. And so, without further ado, there's your daily dosage of shofar, which we blow every day during the month of Elul, hopefully to wake up, because the power of the shofar is very, very unique. It comes from a very deep place, and it goes into a very deep place, and in preparation for the awesome um, experience of the Day of Judgment, Rosh Hashanah, we have this entire month. It's called the Ratzon. It's called Days of Special Supernal Goodwill, because they've been imprinted that way ever since the beginning. These are the days that Moses ascended to Mount Sinai the second time and, and was praying for the forgiveness for Am Yisrael in the wake of the golden calf. What does it mean for these days to be days of, sp of special uh, goodwill? Um, we know that a person can turn to Hashem any time of year. But yet there's something very, very singular about the days of Elul that makes them into days of mercy. And of course, Hashem is above space and time. He doesn't, he doesn't, he's not limited by time, is he? But you see, people are. And so what the challenge is in the month of Elul is to grab hold of yourself and create a vessel, as it were, in order to pour into that vessel all of our yearnings and longings and aspirations to become the people that we want to be. And because these days are saturated, with mercy, because they are days of mercy, then we have this very, very unique opportunity. What do I want to be when I grow up? That's that's what Elul is all about. Well, it's now, so I better make a decision. In other words, who am I? Am I the person that I think I am because I think that you think I am, right? Or am I the person that I know that I can be despite what you think I am? What is what, what, what makes up who I am? Other people? Or who I know that I have to be? So there's a lot of very, very serious introspection in the month of Elul. And it's all this a tremendous compassion and kindness of Hashem that He gives us these opportunities to stop the um, banality and the, the in, inaneness, is that a word? Of, of just the continuum of how it goes every day of our lives. Stop it. And, and like I say, just grab hold of ourselves and think about where we're going and start to get mindful, start to reflect upon the purpose of life, the purpose of life which is closeness to Hashem, realizing Hashem's presence in our lives, and having that make a, an impression, impact, a, a change on every aspect of our lives. That's what Elul is all about. That's what the sound of the shofar is all about. And as we have pointed out, <coughs> the... Torah portions during these days of the month of Elul, they have a particular significance even in their titles. This week's title is Shoftim. Judges begins in verse 18 of chapter 16. The book of De De Deuteronomy, Devarim, talks about how we have to, uh, it opens up saying, appoint judges and officers in all of your gates, which Hashem, your God, gives you. And some of the great rabbis have looked upon this as a metaphor for the gates to our consciousness, whether it's the gates 
to our physical consciousness, our orifices, our eyes and ears and nose, how we and mouth and everything, how we have to set judgment judges there, which is an aspect of our intellect to see like, well, what am I doing? Is this really what I should be doing? And like to look like, wait, like to think and weigh in on that. And officers meaning that we have to also be strict with ourselves and we have to set guidelines and limitations and rules so that we rein in all of those aspects of our personality that run amok. That's, ta that's taking responsibility because as we've taught on many occasions, the, the bottom line of a Torah life, of a Torah consciousness, is accountability. Which of course is such a major difference between our concept of these days leading up to Rosh Hashanah and Rosh Hashanah itself, the new year, and the secular uh, concept of, of Rosh Hashanah, all, all acquaintance be forgot. What is that? Old Lang Syne, just like, and just like, okay, like wild abandonment and, and, and uninhibited um, ribaldry because it's another year. No, it's total accountability because we are the descendants of Adam. Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of Adam's birthday. And we take responsibility for, for who we are and for the whole world. So Elul is this incredible time. And i got to tell you, Parashat Shoftim, one of the amazing things about it is that it is, it is full of mitzvot. There's so many different commandments in this Torah portion. Yitzchak, you want to hazard a guess how many commandments are found in the portion of Shoftim? Um, I'm going to hazard a guess. All right. I'd say 62. <laughs> you're, way, you're way off. It's 41. That was my second guess. 41 mitzvot in Parashat Shoftim, 14 positive commandments, 27 negative. And there's all kinds of commandments here, uh, according to Sefer Chinuch, which lists the commandments. Um, the Parsha actually begins with the 491st mitzvah, which is actually in the count of positive, it's 203, which is indeed to a point. Judges and, and uh, officers in cities. There are many mitzvot here that are relating to justice and society, like the mitzvah of listening to the words of the great Beit Din. Um, there's a commandment to appoint a king over us. There's all sorts of holy temple-related commandments as far as um, offerings to the Kohen and the Truma and different things relating to Kohenim and Levi'im. Then there's the commandment to listen to a prophet, commandment to... Um, separate cities of refuge, and then there's the whole thing about the Edim mm Zomimim, -hmm. which are the witnesses that are conspiring witnesses to set someone up. Um, there's, many, there's many commandments here that are relating to the Holy Temple, specifically like the commandment not to plant a tree in the environs of the Holy Temple on the Temple Mount, or to, or to build a, a platform um, there are commandments that relate to some sort of um, desire for like what you might call today new age spirituality like not to not to try to divine the future not to perform uh, magic not to seek the services of of some clairvoyant or channeler um, uh, not to say false prophecies um, there was com commandments about warfare then there are commandments about warfare as well. So I was thinking, Yitzchak, um, these commandments specifically that relate to spirituality, I was thinking about how they fit in very much also with something that we read last week in Parshat Re'eh. We read, um, that Moshe speaks about how we should not um, listen to a, a, a prophet or a dreamer of a dream who says, let's go and try to follow the ways of the gods who lived in this land before you mm -hmm. and experiment with their, with their um, lifestyles, right? And the great Rabbi Arya Kaplan, in his monumental work, The Living Torah, which is not a literal translation of the Torah, but a conceptual uh, translation of the Torah, he translates the, the words not to follow other gods in a very interesting way, he says, he says, um, don't say, let's, let's try out new spiritual experiences. And today there are a lot of people that want to try out new spiritual experiences because they get bored and they get stuck and they say, you know, like, I want to, I wanna, you know, uh, 
try all sorts of things to get me high, whatever it is, to get me inspired. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this um, challenge and dynamic in, in terms of our everyday experience and how that whole thing about how a person says, like, I want some external um, thing to, to give me a new experience, some new, ex some new spiritual high, some new spiritual... Um, you know, um, dimension. I was thinking about, and, and, and the Torah's prohibition of that, right? I was thinking about how this is like the very diametric opposite of what Elul is all about. Open up your heart in the deepest way. This is a, uh, a serious thing I'm trying okay. to say here. It's like a person wants to uh, kickstart, like jumpstart his his relationship with Hashem, so he's going to, he's going to, uh, Try all of these different practices, or something like that, is what is what these sukkim, these verses are talking about. Versus the whole concept of Elul, which is what, which is that the newness and the inspiration has to come from within me. And that's really the the secret of what Elul is all about. It's like I have not been um, connected to Hashem. I let myself lapse. That's what the teshuva of Elul is. Anila dodi v'dodili. Yeah, exactly. But the bu but again, the uh, the beauty of of Anila dodi v'dodili is this far-reaching Torah concept, which is I have to make the first move. It's up to us. It's up to me. Anila dodi. If mm -hmm. I will, if I will make a move and turn to Hashem and show Him that I'm here, that I'm willing, that I'm able, a sign of life, just like Nachshon ben Aminadav, just like the prince of, of the tribe of, of Yehuda that walked into the sea at the splitting of the sea. He did it first. He went into his nostrils. Then Hashem took over. So we make a move and we show Hashem that we are motivated to be here for Him because He's always there for us, but we lose it, we lose it, we snap. We, we, ha we, lose, our, we lose our cool, we have, a, we have a suspension of judgment. We are not mindful of the beauty of every moment, of every day. And that's what Elul is all. Elul is this unbelievable, divinely orchestrated time out where we can grab hold of ourselves and say, wait a minute, I, I don't want to just somnambulate through my life. I don't want it to just turn into this... This 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 endless, meaningless maze of, of spent time, spent time. Got hold of myself and, and and become mindful again, and so the, the but but again like I, I started saying, th what does it mean these days are days of mercy eight ratzon? Hashem is always the same. He doesn't change. He's always full of the same mercy, radiating the same compassion and caring for us and drawing us close. But we block it. We block it. And so Elul is about my opening up the channels. He doesn't have to open up the channels. Anila Dodi, I have to open up the channels and bring it in. And so, and so it's so interesting that we're reading these prohibitions and these Torah portions about how you shouldn't try this, you shouldn't try that, don't try this, this uh, occult uh, practice and, and these false images and, and false um, you know, spiritual disciplines. They're not real. They're not real. They're just, they're just fantasy. But what's real is inside of me. It's what Hashem already gave me. It's the godly soul. And this this jibes perfectly with the opening verses of uh, Parashat Shoftim and and your uh, interpretation of them earlier. The, you know, to be mindful of your openings of of your your own gates, your eyes, what goes in, what goes out, and to and to clear those passageways of all the of all the sludge and all the dross that's accumulated over the year and to refresh them and and not to try to replace them to make different diversions and other channels but these are the god-given channels that we've been given exactly it's about diversions versus what's real and elul is about my waking up and, <coughs> and taking responsibility for for becoming new again i can do it i can become new again and so havi omer in other words what we're, we're developing this idea here that these Torah portions in particular, Shoftim specifically, all the Torah portions of the book of uh, the book of Devarim that are read during Elul are basically a calling and a challenge to establish a Torah-based society in the land of Israel. That was Moshe's first concern, first primary only concern at this point in his life as he is about to take his leave. And he is prescribing this this plan, prescription for the Torah society in the land of Israel. And you know what? The unbelievable thing is, um, 
this this whole challenge, this whole this whole equation of my taking responsibility, accountability, willing to willingness to recognize my relationship with Hashem, take responsibility for it, establish this horror based society, realize that I have to mo I have to be my motivation, I have to open up my heart for Hashem, versus the other side of experience, which is which is the cheap thrills, the, 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 the placating to others, the, the, the trying to follow the ways of the nations, and, and the basically like the, the, the moral ineptitude of a sellout of trying to basically like um, become something else and not become what I am, which is what Elo is all about. That backdrop of, uh, is, is true not only on the individual level, but on the national level. Absolutely, it is what even on the international it's all level. about right now. It's, it's, what, it's what we're going through right now as a nation, and, and it is like exactly the background of the news. It's, an, it's so important to keep that in mind also because it can be so... It's like prophecy. Parashat Shoftim right, is it. a vision of what we are, of, of we are right now in, in the state of Israel, in the throes of this tremendous battle on a spiritual front of who are we as a people and where are we going. And of course, all of that is totally epitomized by the bruha, the, 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 the tempest in the teapot, of that's still going on, and I'm going to have to talk about it again today. Of this ridiculous um, nation-state law controversy. Mm -hmm. I, was, I, I want to say that it's so important to keep exactly what you said in mind. That what Moshe Rabbeinu is directing us toward is exactly what the struggle is right now. If you don't keep that in mind, you can just become so discouraged. Like, why, after all these years, why are we still discussing this? Why are we arguing? But no. This is precisely what we should be doing at this time, which is working toward working toward transforming our society ever more so I'm into you, a Torah-based society. Who are we? Who uh, uh, the, the individual during the month of Elul is asking himself in all sincerity, "Who am I?" Like I said, am I who I think I am because I know that because I think that you think that this is who I am and therefore that's who I have to be which is exactly what so many people in the state of Israel are saying like to the world like oh I think that you think I'm I'm like this so like I better be that or what, right. or I have to show you that I'm not like that because you because I think that you think that I'm like that but El is like what does Hashem think mm -hmm. about me and what do I think I want to be for Hashem and um a couple of weeks ago, or two weeks ago, was it? We re it took some time, and we read out loud the details of the of the of the the nation state law, right? Which is just been it's been catapulted to the forefront of of, of the news. Like uh, you know, like uh, people are complaining about Jeremy Corbyn, that that uh, that great lover of Israel. He's he's saying, well, you know, you have this apartheid law. Everybody's calling it apartheid, right? Like the, like uh, there's a, uh, uh, pictures that people put up in, in Facebook of shopping in Rami Levy and all these and all these uh, supermarkets with, with, with the Arabs and Jews next to each other and um, and and um, so many other examples of of um, how the use of the word apartheid when it when it comes to Israel is so obscene is so absolutely ridiculous um, and how the nation state law has nothing to do whatsoever with discrimination against uh, the minorities, not against Arabs, not against Christians, not against Jews, not about anybody. It's not about anybody else's right. It's asserting the fact that the Jewish people are supposed to have a homeland and, then, and it guarantees full, full democratic um, rights to, to everybody. But at least say that it's a Jewish state and I'll explain to you why that's so important in a few minutes. But anyway, Again, relating to the nation state law that everybody is talking about how it's so racist and how Netanyahu is such a racist and everything like that and how we have this law. Basically, it just establishes that the, in law that Israel is the historic homeland of the Jewish people, that, that the state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people in which it fulfills its natural, religious, and historic right to self-determination, and that the, ful the fulfillment of the right of national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. Then it talks about national symbols, the flag, and the menorah, and the, and the national anthem. And then it talks about Jerusalem being the capital. And it says that the state will be open to Jewish immigration to the gathering of the exile. It talks about our relationship with the diaspora. And the Hebrew calendar, national holidays. And that's it, basically. 
nothing changed in this in this uh, law in the in the in the um, establishment of this law as a funda- foundational law in the state of Israel. Nothing changed over the past seven decades. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't change the status of Hebrew. It didn't change the status of Arabic. It didn't change the sta- it didn't change the status of the rights of of any people whatsoever. It doesn't take away anyone's rights or challenge um, any anyone's. Um, Rights whatsoever. Nope. Yeah. In, in fact, this most recent protest, which took place in Tel Aviv. So this is what I want to talk which, about, the okay. protest. Right. The pro- which, Go ahead. Which, which really blows the cover of the people who are against it, because this pl- protest, which was organized, uh, I think, by... It was organized by something called the... Um, I'm going to get to it, man. The committee, the, f- the high follow-up committee for Arab citizens of Israel, mm-hmm. is who is who um, organized it. So there's a protest that was held on Saturday night that was attended approximately by uh, uh, by thirty thousand people. Right, thousands of leftists and Arabs arrived on Saturday night in Tel Aviv's Robin Square to protest the nationality law. Right, so at this at this protest. Um, they were waving Palestinian flags and chanting with uh, and chanting quotations from fire. Yasser Arafat about mm-hmm. bringing martyrs to Jerusalem, and uh, oh, millions of martyrs are marching to Jerusalem with blood and fire. We will redeem right. Palestine. So the so uh, and the protesters are under a banner. The banner is no to the nation state law, yes to equality. And so the the uh, protest, which was ostensibly to protest what they're calling this apartheid racist uh, approach um, that Israel is taking by making, by, by declaring that Israel is a Jewish state, became a, a, a protest in support of Palestine and against Israel. A, a, a protest, uh, a statement f- for the destruction of Israel. Yes, exactly. Under, well, under, yes. under the, the, the guise of justice and equality, they are basically... Um, calling for the destruction of Israel. This is much more complex than it sounds. It's, it's extremely important that our listeners understand what this is all about and put into context uh, recent developments not only in Israel but all over the world affecting Israel and affecting all others of Jewish people on the Torah of Israel. There's the music. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Temple Talk. Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin with Rabbi Chaim Richman here in Jerusalem, Israel. Today is the third day of the month of Elul, 5778, 14th day of August, 2018. This coming Shabbat, Parashat Shoftim, which we have been discussing in length as to its importance and relevance to this time period, this period of Elul, importance in its our own personal lives, but also its significance and importance in our national life here in Israel in this time period that we are going through. And everything about it, uh, from the judges and, and the police, you know, the officers, to the way we conduct warfare. Um, to, to the way we seek spiritual fulfillment and, and, and self-identify as a nation. I mean, it's all part of the national debate here. It's all part of the struggle to become uh, what we're what we're supposed to become, as you would say, Rabbi, for the nation to grow up and to, f- to find out what we want to do when we when we grow up as a nation, who we want to be. Who sang that? Did I ever become what you wanted me to be? <laughs> but um, it's just it's incredible how every one of the lines here, every verse in this parsha, just you know, it uh, resonates with all the issues and all the items and articles and everything that's. Re- uh, you, in Israel, not necessarily what uh, the you know outside world has to say or how they perceive it, but I, I think that most of how the outside world sees what's going on here is, is not at all accurate or relevant to the real 
the real challenges here that we face. What was it you were saying to me earlier about, about this um, need for victimization, victimhood, and some people like to identify as victims? No, I just said that, uh, I just saw a tweet. Um, that was a response to somebody else, I don't even know who, but the tweet was uh, apparently tweeted by an Israeli Arab who said, well, you know, welcome to my world where I'm a second-class citizen. And for anybody, you know, victim, victimization, the, the, the celebration of victimhood and the use of, vict of victimization as a political weapon cool. tool right. uh, is, is, is so popular today that so the, the nation-state law, or the, the, the nation-state law, right, yeah. which was, has nothing, doesn't victimize anybody, but it's a perfect gift for all those people that want to claim victimhood so at every, here's every, the deal, really, every imagined slight. To be perfectly clear, there, there never was uh, any resemblance of any apartheid nation um, in any way whatsoever. This, that's why this is so insane. I mean, it, it separate, first of all, the state of Israel from the Hamas-governed uh, enclave of, Ga of the Gaza Strip, where the Hamas terrorist government is basically holding uh, the entire Arab population hostage. That's one. So there, there really is, there really is a, a terrible, uh, you know, discrimination and human and human rights abuses that are perpetrated by the the Palestinian government itself on the Palestinian populace. But as far as the state of Israel is concerned, the whole thing is so ridiculous because there never was any any issue of uh, equal rights whatsoever, and so. But here's the thing, and you have to understand what's going on here. So th th this law is passed, and the whole reason the law is passed is because of the fact that there are those that have been threatening the Jewish character of the state of Israel from day one, and there are very, very strong uh, and powerful forces that are from within and without that are constantly trying to undermine the Jewish nature of the state of Israel and undermine the rights of the Jewish people altogether. So case in point, right? So this law is passed, which is basically not doing anything new except trying to, to, to actually make it uh, fundamental that this is a, a Jewish state, which guarantees democratic uh, full civil rights, etc., for all of, its, all of its people. So then this protest is organized by what's called the Arab Higher, Mo uh, Higher Monitoring Committee. And you have to understand who the Arab, and, and, so, and at this protest, like I said, they're chanting slogans from the arch terrorist murderer Yasser Arafat about how millions of martyrs will will march to Jerusalem and redeem it in blood and fire, and and Palestinian flag is flying, and that they're calling call for equality, right? That's not all they're calling for because the Arab Higher Monitoring Committee. And thank you very much, Mrs. Cohen, for sending me this article. In 2006, the Arab Higher Monitoring Committee published a comprehensive vision paper which basically declares that Israel is just the outcome of a settlement process initiated by the Zionist Jewish elite in Europe, and that Jews have no history in this land, no religious or cultural heritage, and that the Jews, this is according to the, again, the Arab Higher Monitoring Committee, which, is the, which was the sponsor and the organizer of the demonstration against the nation state law. Sta their paper, position paper, states that Jews are nothing but foreign invaders, and that we have no rights to this land whatsoever, but that the Palestinian Arabs in Israel are the indigenous people of the country and have a historic and material relationship with their homeland, emotionally, nationally, religiously, and culturally. They're an integral, integral and vital, inseparable part of the Palestinian people. And I can't even read that without laughing, because as we pointed out so many times, the Museum of, Pal of Palestinian History is empty. There are no Palestinian, uh, there is no Palestinian archaeology, there is no Palestinian language. There is no Palestinian culture because there is no such thing as a Palestinian people because look look it up and understand what the history of this so-called nation is and how one of the very leaders of the PLO himself declared that th it's nothing but a ruse in order to um, take the Arab world to its next stage in its, in its planned destruction of the state of Israel. So the point is that this this whole demonstration against the nation state law claiming that it's apartheid and claiming that it is that it is not is not fair to call this a Jewish state because then you're undermining the the rights of other peoples actually their goal is that it shouldn't be a Jewish state at all but that there should not be any um, any Jewish people here 
And, and, and this is why it's, it's so incredible, because legal equality of all peoples in this land already exists, and nothing had, cha nothing had changed whatsoever with this whole um, hysterical, um, uh, manipulative uh, uh, political uh, and media campaign claiming that this is now the declaration of an apartheid state, which it has no manifestation of whatsoever. So this is what's so incredible about this whole deal, that, that the actual goal of the people who, who organized this demonstration is they're, they're, it's not that they want civil and individual rights. They want what they call a collective national equality. They want to return to the Arab villages. They want, what they, what, they want to destroy the state of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. And they want to turn it into a, a binational or, or a multinational state, an Arab state. Of which, of which there are none, by the way. Right, Every right, Arab right. state that exists is, by, by law, by their own law, a Muslim state that has Sharia law as, as its law. There are no uh, So like the Israeli Arab uh, MK Hanin Zawabi said, she said, it's not about challenging the nation state law, it's about challenging the Zionist ideology. Um, and so, and so, but what about all the Jews who joined in that in that protest? There were th tens of thousands of people there. What about all the Jews who are uh, so ashamed of Netanyahu and who feel that this is such a terrible time for the state of Israel and it's so ugly because because who are we to oppress minorities and all this kind of foolishness? When you see who, what the motivation of the the Arabs who are behind this this whole manipulative um, uh, you know, you know, uh, plot and the very to fact that they were Israel. allowed to, to to hold this demonstration without any uh, police uh, intervention or harassment, you know, proves the lie. So Netanyahu the, comes and he says, "Well, this is proof in itself of why we need this law because they're f flying the Palestinian flag at this at this rally." I want to tell you something exactly what I, what I have in the deepest place in my heart, what this is all about. All these Jews who are participatory. In the uh, who are what I call self-immolating, and they're in, and they're they're and they're beating their breasts, and they're and they're and they're doing their so-called teshuva that they're so uh, upset for their for the Arabs that for the for their beleaguered Arab citizens that because you know we because we had the nerve of calling this a Jewish state, they are nothing but useful idiots. That's exactly what they are, and they are the, they are the epitome of the whole spiritual conflict that we are reading about in this week's Torah portion of who are we? Are we what's being un underlined in Parshat Shoftim, the call to create a Jewish Torah-based nation state? Or are, are we, we going after to false we prophets exactly. and, and, we and soothsayers? False gods and false prophets. And taking on the ways of a... They are such useful idiots. It's absolutely unbelievable, okay? I mean, let, me, let me give you uh, two examples, okay? So, so, so concurrently, as I'm reading all about these, this demonstration and all the and all the this, this total lunacy of these Jews who are basically, who are basically inadvertently calling for the destruction of their own country by by joining in, with the with the Arabs who are basically calling not for the not for the cessation of the nation state law but for the station, cessation of the state of Israel. Concurrently, I'm reading an article, about how this PA resident, who rescued this Jewish family. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, two years ago, that were that were they rescued them from a terror attack, right? And Rabbi M Michael Mark was murdered, right, near the settlement of Utniel. So they're 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 driving home this 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 family, and their vehicle is attacked by terrorists from from a certain Palestinian village in Dora, and, and they shot 19 bullets from a moving bu a moving vehicle. The family vehicle was overturned, killing Rabbi Mark and wounding other members of the family. And then uh, they ret the terrorists returned to make sure the entire family had died. But then this Arab and his wife, who were coming from a nearby village, saw what was going on. And then they, they immediately uh, stopped to see what had happened. They saw the wounds. They saw the bullets. And they saved these people. And now that this Palestinian Arab saved this Jewish family f uh, from, the, uh, from the terrorists, they saved the rest of them from being murdered, this, this man's life is being threatened. He can't go back to the Palestinian Authority. He's received death threats. Why has he received death threats? For saving the Jews. 
understand, he, he, he says they'll kill me as soon as they hear that I'm back. They'll never forget, no matter how long it takes them. And they're being uh, threatened. How dare they save these Jewish people? And these are the, these are the people that are, that are misguided, idiotic brethren are standing arm in arm under the Palestinian flag and they are calling for equ equality and they're calling for the, 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 the terrible nation state law should be struck. And these are, these are our peace partners. This is who the Palestinian Authority is. Forget about Hamas, that they're threatening the life. There's another piece I'm just reading about, about how Israel is withholding a million shekels in tax revenue from the PA because they torture so-called collaborators that work with Israel. And there's a whole number of Palestinian citizens that have been tortured by the Palestinian Authority. And Israel is withholding, withholding tax to pay for the court case against the Palestinian Authority. This is how they treat anybody who wants to have anything to do with Israel. They torture so-called collaborators. And there, there's, a, there's a price upon the head of this, of this fellow, this Arab, <coughs> Arab who was driving by, who was motivated to save a human life. He sees a Jew was attacked, Jewish family was attacked, and he goes out to save them, and now they want to kill him because he saved Jews. And, and by the same token, you know, anybody who travels in Judea and Samaria and travels to the various Jewish communities that are, that are um, interspaced between the Palestinian villages, you know that in, in these areas there are these huge red signs that are posted outside the entrance to Palestinian villages, posted by the IDF. These huge red signs that, this is exactly what it reads in English. These signs outside pa Palestinian villages. It says, this road leads to area A under the Palestinian Authority. The entrance for Israeli citizens is forbidden, dangerous to your lives, and is against the Israeli law. If a Jew inadvertently drives into a Palestinian village, he probably will be murdered, lynched, or worse. And there are these, these huge signs that anybody can see. I'll Google it. Google those words, and you'll see what the sign looks like. The sign reads, this road leads to Area A under the Palestinian Authority. The entrance for Israeli citizens is forbidden, dangerous to your lives. You will not find a sign like that outside any Jewish town. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is what is just so absolutely ludicrous about all these fools and, and idiots talking about how Israel is an apartheid state. The only places that are apartheid are Palestinian communities where Jews will be, will be butchered for venturing there. And even Palestinians' lives are in danger if they even express any solidarity whatsoever with Jews. And yet these, these lobotomized liberal Jews go marching in, in Tel Aviv under Palestinian flag. That very flag is a banner of murder and mayhem and butchery, right? And, and uh, that's one thing I wanted to point out. Another thing I want to point out is, uh, speaking of how uh, they have the nerve of saying that Israel is an apartheid state, and, that, and you find those signs outside Palestinian villages because Jewish life will, uh, is in danger, right? So there's another article that I'm reading today that the Supreme Court uh, rejected a petition against this illegal mosque. This mm -hmm. is an illegal mosque that's being built for many, many years, right? And the Supreme Court will not stop it from being built, make a long story short. It's a legal piece. It's on, on property. It's on privately owned privately property, owned right? Property. And, so, and so the Supreme Court was petitioned because when it comes to Jewish homes that are supposedly uh, being built illegally, the Supreme Court stops them immediately, evicts the Jews, expels them, destroys the homes. And here there's a mosque that's being built, and they won't stop it. So that's not exactly apartheid, it's the opposite. It's discrimination, it's discrimination against the Jews. So when it says in our, in our, in our parsha, it says uh, judges and, uh, <laughs> and officials uh, appoint, appoint for yourselves, it's, it's not just talking about any judges, it's talking about judges that will, uh, will have uh, eyes in their heads and uh, see the difference between right and wrong and not uh, what passes for judges it's so often. It's so infuriating. Come to Israel and, and look and see how Jews and Palestinians live side by side and look at these red signs that I'm talking about and look at the, the, the judiciary and how the Jewish people are totally discriminated against and how um, 
the the Jewish people who think that to be Jewish means to be liberal and to be and to be and to identify with the so-called under underdog and to be ashamed of yourself and to and to want to uh, uphold the rights of everyone but yourself, they're being used. They're being used by the by this group of leftists and anarchists and and and. Um, Whoever they are, that whose goal is to totally destroy the, Ju the the Jewish state, not destroy its Jewish character, destroy it altogether, and their greatest allies are this by these bumbling hapless Jews that maybe they mean well somehow, but they are actually participating in in attempts to destroy themselves. So. You may be reading the parsha this week, but we're living it uh, on a daily basis, and uh, but that's not a cause for despair. I think that's a cause for for joy because we are back here where we're supposed to be, and uh, and uh, the words of, of Moshe Rabbeinu are are just so on target for where we are uh, in this moment in our history and in this place in the land of Israel. That every word of of this of this Torah reading is just so relevant to to our efforts uh, that we make uh, that we're making, you know, twenty four seven to you know how you can pull the whole to thing together. Turn this to a to a, a Torah society. You know, we read in in, ch in chapter twenty about the um, the Kohen who is anointed for battle and how he speaks to the people and he gives them a speech before they go out to war. He says. He says, Hear, O Israel, you're coming near to the battle against your enemies. Let your heart not fall. Do not be afraid, do not panic, and do not be broken before them. For Hashem, your God, is the one who goes with you to fight for you with your enemies to save you. And then, as you know, he addresses those who are unqualified to fight. Mm -hmm. He said, Then the officers, the, not the Kohen, the officers shall speak to the people, saying, Who is the man who has built a new house and has not inaugurated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in war, and another man will inaugurate it. And who is the man who has planted a vineyard and not redeemed it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the war, and another man will redeem it. And who is the man who has betrothed a woman and has not married her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the war, and another man will marry her. And then the officer shall continue speaking to the people and say, And who is the man who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, and let him not melt the heart of his fellows like his heart. And then when the officers have finished speaking to the people, the leaders of the legion shall take command at the head of the people. So this is the whole thing right here. Like, who is, and of course, this was, this was added, while well, the people who just made a vineyard and built a house and got married are, are leaving, exit stage left, so that they, that they can perform their duty, because it's only right. They don't have to be conscripted now. And then other people, un under cover of that, they can, they can surreptitiously leave, mm -hmm. because he's, he also said, now who's afraid? Who is simply afraid to fight here? And I think that what it all boils down to is that some people are afraid of, of what we started, started speaking about, the accountability, the responsibility. It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing to take command and to fight. And this is really what it's all about. Are you afraid to be a Jew in the land of Israel? Are you afraid to stand up and declare that this is a Jewish state? Are you afraid to stand up and declare this is who we are? That's what Elul is all about. It's not who you think we are, who I think that I have to be because I know that you think that that's who I am. This is who we are. This is exactly what's going on right now. And of course, the, the, the secret mystical reason for why these people have to leave is because they're drawing down a negative energy on the entire people because they are so, um, so not convinced of the righteousness of their, of their own path. In other words, those who are afraid and faint-hearted, they're acting like a wick and they're pulling down negativity because they are not connected to Hashem because they're disconnecting themselves with their own negativity. That's exactly when I look at a rally like that with tens of thousands of people and with, and with Jews under a Palestinian flag, which is synonymous with murder, and calling for, for equality and, 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 and the end of apartheid, which actually they're just being used and they're useful idiots because the, because the Arab um, committee that organized that rally is not about equality and it's not about an end to apartheid. It's about the end to the Jewish people and the end of the state of Israel. And the Jews are like, yeah, yeah, man, like we're right there with you. Like peace, love, dope, like, like the 60s, yeah, like help flowers to bring down and the gun government barrels. That's it. not what this is all about. Yeah, in fact, the Druze community 
uh, which which felt an honest uh, uh, injury uh, because of the law, which I don't think is 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 justified. But I understand their their injury. They distanced themselves. They didn't participate in this uh, in this protest. They distanced themselves from the start and said, "No, this is not about us." And uh, you know, we would never, ever, God forbid, wave another flag. Uh, other than the Druze flag, which is not a national flag, but it's a flag of their community and the flag of Israel, which they very, very much believe in. So not everybody um, here is a useful idiot, and and the community that's whose who's shock at the law sort of sparked the whole thing uh, was very, very uh, certain to distance themselves from this uh, disaster in Tel Aviv. There's the music, Rabbi. We'll have to pick this up again. Time to do tshuva. Yeah, thanks for being with us, Temple Talk.